Ready? Y'all ready? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, all right, all right, all right. Go ahead, sit down, go ahead, sit down, go ahead, sit down. Give me a fake. Clap for the band. A lot of work. That's a lot of work. Awesome, awesome. Hey, let me, let me start by helping you under, get this, get this. The more you are all in, the more you will get out. Y'all hear what I'm saying? All right, I have a really good friend, a good, really good friend. We grew up together. He became a doctor. He ended up becoming uh, doctors across borders. So he went to Africa. He went to Africa. And when he got to Africa, they asked him if he would teach English to these kids while he was doing his doctor stuff. And so he did. The first day he's with these kids, something happened. And I'm going to be honest with you. I totally forgot about this until about a week and a half ago. I was watching basketball, college basketball. And Oklahoma State was playing basketball. And the guys on the bench all had the same T-shirt on. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I text my friend, and he called me. And I said, you ain't going to believe what's on these boys' T-shirts. And we laughed about it. But let, now let me back up and tell you a story. So he is in South Africa. He's in, actually, he's in East Africa. And he's, he's going, bro, it, huh, when you get up in the morning, go outside, and it's 98. At 6 a.m., it's going to be a long day, okay? And he's like his first day with these kids, and they have outdoor school. So it's all outside, and he's like, I'm going to die. I am going to die. So he's with these kids, 22 students, and he decided, I'm going to have fun. So he went, and he bought a bucket, and he bought candy, enough candy to fill this bucket. And the bucket's like that deep, about that big around, with a lot of candy. So they're outside, and he puts the bucket down. He walks over to the kids, and he goes, when I count to three, the first kid to the bucket gets all the candy for themselves. One, two, three. 22 students. They hadn't said nothing. They all jumped up, linked arms, and ran to the bucket. Sit down, and they all started eating candy together. He went down and he says, wait a minute, what are you doing? And one of the kids go, teacher, unbutu, U-N-B-U-T-U. That's what was on the T-shirts of those guys from Oklahoma State University. Needless to say, they got a player on their team who's from that village in Africa. And he came to play for Oklahoma State and taught them this. You know what the English translation is for unbutu? I am because we are. That's it. I am because we are. If one hurts, we all hurt. If one wins, we all win. If there's a bucket, we're locking arms, we're going together. If I get candy, you get candy. Unbutu. I think we need that on the cover of a church somebody. It's awesome to think that way, to be that way. But you have an opportunity in this band of brothers that we have in this room right now to be a part of just something like that. My sermon today, oh, if you only knew what was about to happen. We're about to go at it, all right? But I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to just chill and get your head right, all right? Because we're going to go at it on this one. So I got to play a song for you. Uh, the song I decided today, I love Jesus. And to be honest with you, this song, the title of it says, You're My Everything. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest, there's no words, it's just music. But it was my mom's favorite song. And I just, you're my everything. About the love of Christ and what he did for me, you're my everything. How I can't breathe and I can't move because you're my everything. And hopefully this will get you ready for what we're about to talk about. But it simply says, you're my everything.
we got to go all the way back to medieval times. The day that the kings and the queens ruled. They would have these assemblies where they would gather all the people. And as the people would get there, they would wait and wait and wait. Usually there'd be one door that everyone would be focused on. And without fail, as that door begins to open, someone or some people would cry out as loud as they can these words. Long live the king. And the king himself would walk into the room. Today, in our last session of our men's conference, I simply want to set the stage for the next part of our journey together. Because we serve a king who's not dead, but he's alive. We serve a king who took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We serve a king who still has his hands on the pulse of this world. So my thing and my title is simply, Long Live the King. But my brothers, you in this with me today. So every time you hear me say that phrase, long live the king, your job is to yell back to me, long live the king. I don't care if it takes three hours for me to do this sermon. Every time I say it, you repeat it after me. Long live the king. That is pretty good, but it ain't good enough. We got to say it like the king is in the room. We got to say it like our Lord and Savior is in this place because he is. Long live the king. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, you ain't doing it like he died for you. Touch your other neighbor and say, you ain't doing it like he's got a plan for you. Somebody say, long live the king. Long live the king. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to look at your neighbor and say, it's about to go down up in here. Look at your other neighbor and say, here we go. I got to do this right. Got to do this right. I want to take you through the Bible to those points where all you could say was long live the king. There one. Oh, come on. I like this side. What's up over here? You got the hair, but you ain't got the ears. Come on. There was a boy named David. He had to fight a giant named Goliath. Y'all remember that story? But there's something about this story I want to take you to that you never noticed. David's brothers went to fight in a battle, but his daddy sent him to watch the sheep. Here's the cool thing. While he was watching the sheep, one day a lion came out of the woods trying to kill the sheep, but he killed the lion. Then a bear tried, like he didn't watch the news or something. And so he killed the bear, but he never told anybody. I like that about David. Because, see, we have to kill the lion and the bear in our private life so that we can kill the giant in the public eye. If you ain't willing to go through those struggles that no one sees and fight with Jesus to get to victory, then you can't stand on the platform and kill a giant and have the world say that you're the king. Somebody say, long live the king. Long live the king. But when he was able to face that giant and he took him down, something happened in the discussion that I want to talk to you about. Look at the screen. The first scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. Watch this. So David is at the battle line. The Philistine is there too. Look what happened. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Here's a little kid facing a giant. And it had to make the giant stop for a second because when he advanced, David ran toward him. Why did David do that? Because he knew he wasn't fighting this battle by himself. Even though he was looking at a giant, he saw a bigger giant behind him. Who did he see? Long live the king. As you face your giants, who do you see behind your problem? Who do you see behind your pain? Who do you see behind your struggle? Long live the king. Let's keep going. Watch this. Look up here. Look up here. Look what happens. It says this, 1 Samuel 17, 51. He's going to face the giant, right? David ran and stood over him, and he took hold of the Philistine sword, and he drew it from his shaft, and he killed him and cut his head off with the sword. Listen to me. The battles that you're facing, the stuff that you're going through, hey, don't just knock it down and don't just knock it out. It is time for us to cut its head off. 
Cut the head off the shame. Cut the head off the problem. Cut the head off your past. You can't go back anyway. Own it and let's go. How can we go? Because we serve the king. Long live the king. Now something happened. It's crazy. Let me show you the secret in this whole thing with David and Goliath. Look at the Bible. Next one. 1 Samuel 17, verse 55. As King Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? Let's keep going. Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty. I don't know. Keep going. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. Can, can I just put this for young people, all you young brothers in the room? Let me help you out. David's going to face Goliath before he cut his head off. All of a sudden, the king looks at the commander of the army and says, hey, who's his daddy? Who's his daddy? He goes, I don't know. So find out who his daddy is. Everybody do me a favor. Touch your neighbor right now and say, who's your daddy? Touch your other neighbor. Say it again. Say, hey, who's your daddy? Let's go to the next one. Next scripture. Watch this. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before King Saul. And David still holding the Philistine's head. So he going up to the king like, what up, G? You had my trophy. Word. And look what the king did. Okay, the king could have said a lot of things. Whose son are you? So literally, he just killed, killed, killed the giant. He goes up to the king. King has said, thank you. You saved us all. You're amazing. You're wonderful. Instead, he goes, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? My brothers, it is time for us to go back after this day and go home into our house tonight and have our wife look at us. And within 10 seconds after you make the coffee for her, instead of her making coffee for you, she's going to look at you and say, where you been? You go, man's conference. Then tomorrow, your children are going to get up and there's something different. You got ready before they did. You're ready to go to church. All of a sudden, you're looking at your kids going, there's a big black man at church today. You need to come hear him. Let's go. Let's go. By the time tomorrow afternoon comes, your wife is going to look at you and say, who's your dad? Daddy. And you get to say, long live the king. Come on, long live the king. Then Monday morning you go to school. Monday morning you go to work. Monday morning you go to your normal activity. Monday morning you go lift weights. And somebody's going to see something different about you. And they're going to look at you and say, hey, what did you do this weekend? And you just simply look at them and go, long live the king. Come on, say it to your neighbor, long live the king. Hey, if he is our king, if he is our savior, if he is our Lord, it is time for us to start living it in a way that other people are attracted to us. Somebody say, long live the king. Hey, somebody's starting to get riled up with me in this one. I started by myself about 12 minutes ago, but I think I'm going to end this thing with some brothers in the room deciding that they're about to pick up their arms and fight for our king and our Lord and our savior and his name's Jesus. There are some giants who need their heads cut off in our world. And guess what? We are living and we're breathing and God uses living breathing, so it might as well be us. Somebody say, long live the king. Long live the king. If not us, who? If not now, when? I'm feeling pretty good right now. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, let's do this. Touch your other neighbor and say, let's do this. Oh, it doesn't just stop right there. It keeps going. It keeps going and going. This whole long live the king, long live the king. Watch this. Where am I at next? I ain't even looking at my, I didn't even open my iPad. Uh, who's your son? Young man. Okay, I already did that. All right, what's the next verse? Where am I at? Ooh. Ooh. This is good. This is good. Okay, there was this kid named Stephen, all right? He wasn't one of the disciples, one of the 12. But now Jesus gone, right? And all of a sudden, the Stephen dude, he got a hold of God. And he decided, long live the king. So he started preaching, preaching, preaching. He ended up being put in jail. They stoned him, but the brother didn't die. And they put him in jail. Now he's in jail. And they're like, we're going to bring charges against you. We're going to bring charges against you. So they brought charges against him. And they decided for what he did, preaching the gospel of Jesus, he deserved to be stoned to death. So they drug him out. Outside, Stephen, and they started stoning him. They're throwing these rocks at him. This happens while they're beating him. Look at it. 
While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Mm, let's keep going. When the members of the Sanhedrin had heard this, they were furious and gashed their teeth at him. Okay, now, it's one thing being stoned to death, but then you give honor to God for being beat up. That makes people really mad. So now they're really throwing rocks. Watch this. Then, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stop right there. Go back, go back. Can you go back? Look at that last phrase. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Let me do it one more time. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I got to do this one time. Long live the king. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. Jesus never stands at the right hand. He sits at the right hand. The only time he stands is in Revelation when God says, come back. But there's one time before that, and it's right here when this dude, Stephen, is being stoned to death. All of a sudden, here's Jesus standing at the right hand. Okay, come on. What's next? What do I got next? Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Is that the last one? For that one? See, is there more? Is there more? Ooh, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him. Okay, game over. They forgot the rocks. Let's just beat this brother down. Keep going. Dragged him out into the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Hmm. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. He fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that we as men have the opportunity in my mind to do something while we're human on earth so great that the day we breathe our last breath with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see the heavens open and God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Do y'all get why Jesus was standing at this moment? Oh, it's real simple. When Stephen was dying and the heavens opened, Jesus stood up and went. Don't y'all get it? That's my boy. That's my kid. He did it right while on earth. It didn't look like it was right. But in heaven, it caused Jesus to give him a standing ovation. And when that brother came through the pearly gates, every angel was like, had a sharpie. Sign my wing, bro. Sign my ring, Stephen. Sign my wing. You the man. I don't know if that's attainable on earth. But if it is, I want to be that dude. Long live the king. Long live the king. Long live the king. Long live the king. Is there another one? Is there another one? Do I have more? Ooh, I have. Ooh, I have more. Boy, do we have more. Oh, this is my favorite one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I used to say Shadrach, Meshach, and a big Negro, but I can't say that anymore, all right? Y'all didn't know he was the original brother, did you? You know I'm feeling at home if I pull that one out right there. Not so black and white. All right, here we go. Look at this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Stop right there. You know why I'm saying that? Here it is. This king made a statue of himself. He said, when the music plays, everybody bow. Bow to me. I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. I'm everything. Bow to me. And there's these three Hebrew children, and they're like, no, no, there's only one God. There's only one king. So we wouldn't call you king, but we know you ain't the king. 
And he wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bow. They would not bow. They were like, I ain't doing it. I ain't going to do it. And then they said, if you do not bow, we will throw you into the fiery furnace. All right? So everybody, they played the music. Everybody bowed. But these three brothers did not bow. They stood there. They stood there. <laughs> they like, nah, bro. When they brought him to the king, that's what they told him. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. <clears throat> Let's go to the next one. I like this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. In other words, even if I die, I ain't got to worry about you no more. I like this. Look at the next one. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Okay, now look, this brother got mad. He got real mad. He got real mad. So mad that he said, make it even hotter. And they made it so hot that when the dude opened the door, he died, all right? So they ended up throwing these brothers into the fiery furnace, just watching them burn. Watch them burn. Watch them burn. Watch this. I got to go ahead and say, watch this. Then Nebuchadnezzar, who was furious, said with, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the original brother. And he, he attempted to hoard them and challenged. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than it usually is. Watch this. Then, 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 ready, go ahead. Go ahead. Next one. It says, then King Nebuchadnezzar, he leapt to his feet. I love this. After they threw him in. He leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked all his advisors, what, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. Look at the next one. He says, he said, look. Everybody say, look. look. Everybody say, see. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the Son of God. Somebody clap your hands right now. Long live the King. Long live the King. I see another standing in the fire. I see another holding back the sea. Don't you know who we believe in today? Don't you know who we sang to this morning? Don't you know this God that we believe in? He's able to save us. Yeah, buddy. There's two words. You ready? Everybody say unbound. Untied. Come on. Unbound. Untied. One more time. Unbound. Untied. Don't you get it? Some of you have gotten stuff that tied you up in this world. It's tied you up. But guess what? He is the king of glory. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God. Strong in battle. They can tie you up. But he's going to loose those chains. Unbound, untied. All my things in my past, unbound, untied. The words I've said I wish I hadn't, unbound, untied. The sorrow that I've caused, unbound, untied. The regrets that I have, unbound, untied. The drugs that I've done, unbound, untied. The places I wish I'd never gone, unbound, untied. Don't you see who he is today? If he did it for them, he could do it for you. And then people will look at your life and say, wasn't he bound and tied? Well, look, he's unbound, untied, and there's not just him. There's another standing with him, and he looks like the Son of God. Somebody, for 10 seconds, let's give God a praise report right now. <laughs> Clap your hands if you know what I'm talking about. Touch your neighbor and say, all right, all right, all right. Somebody say, long live the king. Long live the king. Long live the king. Can I do one more? Can I do one more? Everybody watch this. All right. All right. In Daniel chapter 6, we're going to talk about this dude, Daniel. Now, here's what's crazy about Daniel. He was the king's right-hand man. The king got to hang out with him. The king watched him and God do incredible things. But there's, these other, there's always other people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Other people, other people who do not have that same relationship that you have with God. And they'll tell everybody, oh, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. When really... There are wolves in sheep clothing. Daniel had to deal with that. They made this decree. Somehow got the king to sign it. And it was simply that if anyone prays, they get thrown in the lion's den. All of a sudden, it became a law. And here's Daniel. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room 
where the windows opened. Everybody say open. One more time, say open. Sometimes we just read over key words. You're not supposed to pray. He goes to the one room where the windows are open. Well, you think he's scared. Windows are open toward Jerusalem. Watch this. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God. Just said he had done before. Keep going. Three times. At the first light of dawn, oh, dude, I, I jumped ahead because I knew I was running out of time. So let me explain why we're going to read this. The king found out. Everybody told the king, Daniel, he prayed. He prayed. I heard him. He was facing Jerusalem. His window was open. He don't care. If he cared, he at least closed his window. He don't care. You got to throw him in the lion's den. So he had to. The king had to. So he throws Daniel in the lion's den. And then he had to go to bed. I don't think the king slept too well because at first dawn, the king leaped up. The king, the king. He didn't send a servant. You know how many you send servants? The king leaped up, and he hurried to the lion's den. The king himself ran. You know when he's running, there's people running after him. Where's he going? Why is he going to the lion's den? Dan Daniel, he dead. That brother, he like, he's like dinner and breakfast. Watch this. <laughs> I love this. When he came near the den, he called out to Daniel. Daniel, in anguish in his voice, he was scared. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve countlessly been able to rescue you from the lions. Look at the next verse. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. I don't think he was talking about him. Are y'all with me on that? Hey, just leave that up. I'm going to leave it. Just leave that scripture right there. You know he was talking about the one true God. In other words, he said, long live the king. Oh, long live the king. Long live, the king. Long live the king. Hey, listen to me. I don't know who holds tomorrow, but I know it's Jesus. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring Reggie, but if I stay with Jesus, it's going to be all right. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Dude, I have nothing to lose. And I'm going to tell you right now, I preached hard and fast for a reason because I am here to tell you. I think God wants to do something in the men who are in this room right here, right now. Because we have an opportunity, not by ourselves, as a band of brothers. Let's go right now in our mind to the Ukraine. Let's go in one of those basements where there's about, what, 112 men. Weapons, and they go, listen, we're surrounded. There's no way out. What do you want to do? And one by one, they decide to lay down their life for their country. To fight to the death for the Ukraine. This is happening as we speak right now. As we speak. But we have something in A, no disrespect, but it's greater than a Ukrainian government. Greater than the land that we live on because we have a God who created that country. He created our country. He created the trees and the water. He did it all. We have an opportunity to live the rest of our life for Jesus. And every breath we take, we have an opportunity to simply say, Long live the king! Long live the king! How far are you willing to go this morning? How far are you willing to go? For the one who gave everything for us. How far are you willing to go? For our Savior, our King, Jesus. Bow your heads. Band, come on. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Son of God, Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, Jesus, the great I am, Jesus, the one who paid the sacrifice for you and me, Jesus, the one who loves us, Jesus, the one who gave his life for us, Jesus. Long live the king. 
Long live the king. Long live the king. With every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. Here's what I'm going to do. I would like to give you 60 seconds to count the cost. 60 seconds. This moment right now is a sacred moment. All heaven and all hell is watching what the youngest brother in this room is going to do and the oldest. 60 seconds in your mind to count that cost. In your mind, take a piece of paper, put a line halfway down and across the top. On one side in 60 seconds, write everything you can do without God. I don't care what it is nastiest sin, the most perverted thing you could think of in your mind that you could do. On the other side, I want you to write this. Long live the king. That's it. And when this 60 seconds are over, every man in this room has an opportunity to declare something in front of every brother still in this room. When 60 seconds are over and you counted the cost, you've listed it. Oh, long live the king. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? How can I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. If you decide to go all in with Jesus, if you decide to go all in with Jesus, you're going to hear me scream after 60 seconds, long live the king. And if you decide to go all in with Jesus, I want you to jump up on your feet, put both fists in the air, and as loud as you can, scream, long live the king. And we're going to sing a chorus, and we're going to see what God has to do. But I'm going to ask you right now, for 60 seconds, count the cost. For 60 seconds count the cost. It don't matter what you did yesterday. You can't change your past, but this is your moment. This is our moment. Nobody's any different than any other. Every pastor is making that declaration right now. We're all doing this right now. So you have 60 seconds. But after that, you have to respond. The rule is simple. 60 seconds. You'll hear me yell after 60 seconds, long live the king. If you all in, you'll jump up, both fists in the air, and scream, long live the king. And we'll hit a chorus, and we'll sing it loud and proud, and see what God has for us. The clock starts now.